content warning. Bella Donna of Sadness is an adult film centered around the trial of its protagonist, Jeanne, that contains graphic imagery with serious themes such as essay. This may cause emotional distress. Please exit the video if you are uncomfortable with this discussion. Introduction In the 60s and 70s, we saw some striking experiments in animated feature films, applying comparatively complex narrative structures and dramatic elements, which contrasted against the typical expectations, which restricted animated films to simplified storylines that were delivered in a cheerful, straightforward manner. Europe had theatre of Mr. and Mrs. Cabal, Fantastic Planet, and the revolution caused by Yellow Submarine. Japan's Walt Disney and God of Manga, Osamu Tezuka, led the way with his studio, Mushi Productions, releasing three adult-themed feature films now known as the Anime Rama Trilogy. 8001 Nights in 1969, Cleopatra in 1970, and Belladonna of Sadness in 1973, all of which were directed by Eiichi Yamamoto, but the earlier features had no direct involvement from Tezuka, unlike Belladonna, although it was Yamamoto who did all the heavy lifting. Belladonna, the best known internationally, would earn a reputation as a trippy cult film full of metamorphosis for cinephiles and anime enthusiasts, but reception to this film is extremely polarised. On one hand, the perspective is that this film is an expression of feminist liberation through its apparent support of sexual positivity in its latter half the overthrowing of patriarchy and its representation of female solidarity. It is argued by this side that Belladonna exceeds the stereotypical understanding of animation, being original in its ability to use the profusion of adult content in Japanese animation to challenge and critically engage with its audience. Despite the film's explicit content, its intention is apparently not to arouse, but rather demonstrate Jeanne, the protagonist's empowerment through abstracted visuals and a redemptive narrative structure. Whilst the anime Rama trilogy paralleled the shifting cultural dynamics, new attitudes towards sex and sexual imagery of Japan, Belladonna is, at the other end, perceived as an extremely sad sexploitation film in line with the other films of that period. As Japan began cranking out pink films at a high rate and the end of America's Haze Code. I'll touch on this debate throughout the analysis and go over the production context at the end, but I don't think there's really a clear answer on how to interpret this piece. Whether it is a visually unique, highly stylized exploitation of erotica that got classed as an art film because of its dizzying psychedelic imagery, expected to have a deeper message, politics and projected modern western values, or simply feminist, will ultimately be up to you. After all, the freedom of interpretation is what makes art art. The film's opening sequence unfolds like a fairy tale, static hand-drawn characters glide across the screen, accompanied by a whining voice repeating Belladonna. The optimistic song narrates the exposition which informs viewers that Jeanne and Jean were blessed by the heavens, giving testimony of their love through their wedding in which the village would accept their union with joy. One of the saddest things to me is that Jeanne and Jean are not only in love with each other, but also loved by the villagers, Jeanne in particular. White space enhances the vibrancy of their happy, naive marriage with its contrast. The lyrics exalt the internal and external beauty of our protagonist, Jeanne, beautiful and made to suffer, announcing that God was smiling at their fortune and their future was bright. But this was only the beginning. The heroine's theme song is inherently connected to her thoughts and feelings every time her pride and purity was bent. It's this rich imagery and jovial atmosphere, a combination of bright warm colours and whimsical music, that establishes an idyllic tone during the sequence and subsequently provides a startling jolt with what follows. When the music stops, the tone is quickly disrupted, priming the viewer to witness a tragedy. As the scene transitions to the local baron's castle, the colours become more ominous. In line with the customs, poor farmer Jean visits to pay a traditional marriage tax or levy for the wedding. The baron is ghastly, skeletal and grotesque, appearing as though he has no eyes and three bones in the shape of a cross stuck in his skull. 
Zhang offers him the money he raised by selling their only cow in exchange for the Baron to entrust him with Zhang. The Lord and his court, upon seeing how beautiful Zhang is and how poor Zhang is, asks for a wage equivalent to 10 cows that is impossible for the poor farmer. Zhang pleads for the lady's mercy, who already having exhibited malice early on, asks whether Zhang is chaste or not. To which the villagers lord her with praise, asserting that there is nothing lustful about her. The lady's design is a reference to the evil queen, so like Snow White's vindictive stepmother, the lady, jealous of Jeanne's beauty and purity, insists that Jeanne must give her maiden head to the court and lord, enacting the right of the lord. Despite its X-rated reputation, Tezuka is extremely coy about showing private parts, leading to a scene that is paradoxically graphic yet abstract. After Jean is thrown out of the castle, imagery shows Jeanne's white body being torn between her legs against a solid black backdrop. Stark contrast is created from the limited colour palette, emphasising the brutality of her assault. This is where the debate of fetishistic torture and accusations of glorifying SA come in. Is it counterproductive to portray SA with gorgeous visuals? One counter argument to the idea that the film failed to show that there is nothing pretty about SA is that the strong imagery robs the scene of any arousing or stimulating potential. Hence, it was never meant to be sexual or fetishistic, only revolting and pressing. Moreover, a major theme in the film concerns appearance. A devil is later introduced and says, who said anger and hatred are ugly, suggesting the wicked can be beautiful and the good can be ugly. With the priest and the baron whose skull has bones in the shape of a cross, representing the good side because they are allied with God, but appear ugly and grey. Therefore, the portrayal of S.A. as beautiful is actually proposing it is evil. In addition, violence is contrasted with the beautiful and the depiction of Jeanne's body. Regardless, there is plenty of discussion regarding the inclusion of S.A. scenes in media, with some asserting it can be cathartic, whilst others maintain it as needlessly traumatic. For the story to work, the ritual deflowering is unavoidable as it sets in motion the resulting chaos of Jeanne's turmoil and lays the foundational narrative and tone for the rest of the film. Bats then swarm the scene, obscuring Jeanne from view, which could symbolise death and rebirth as bats live in the deepest parts of Earth, which some call the Earth's womb. Bats are also an example of no matter how dark life gets, you can always find the light at the end of the tunnel or cave. During the act, there are no explicit frames depicting the perpetrators committing the violence, with the exception of three shots between the sequences which reveal the Baron on top of her, confirming S.A. The next sequence shows a red mass which dominates the frame and pulses within Jeanne's torso in white monotone, which is representative of Jeanne's purity in contrast to the red violence. The stylized depiction of S.A. is therefore an artistic representation of her experience as opposed to an exact reproduction of the violence. It is argued that the film ultimately prioritises Jeanne's perspective as a victim and focuses on illustrating her internal distress by visualising her attack in an abstract form which predominantly omits the presence of her attackers. The Queen's page then dances joyfully on her arm at her misery and subsequently we see crows caught silently at her side. Whilst good omens in Japan, crows in European literature typically represent death, danger, misfortune and rebirth. Shortly after, we see the first change in Jeanne's hair, completely black. As Jeanne screams into the abyss, this is perhaps her last straw. This is perhaps the exact point in which Jeanne begins her transformation into a witch. The scene is argued as a success in avoiding the exploitation of its subject. The abstract nature of the SA afforded by animation emphasises the emotional impact of the violent assault on Jeanne instead of likely compromising the effective significance of the scene in a live action format for a violent visual spectacle. Moreover, it could allow the viewer to interpret the surreal elements through their own individual experiences. In the aftermath, Jeanne arrives at Jeanne's farm in her torn dress. Initially, Jean comforts her by saying they can forget what happened and they can start over. But following their embrace, Jean, unable to get over what happened, puts his hands around Jean. Ashamed, Jean flees and Jean's hair is once again black, signalling another low point. 
Following this, Zhang stares at her reflection in a cloudy mirror. The devastation is very clear and the blurry image doesn't even look like herself, but Zhang is incredibly strong, constantly preserving herself and will to live. Instead of breaking down, she fixes her hair and begins to clean herself. Before we move on, I just wanted to touch on the colour symbolism of Zhang's hair. Belladonna is a playground for colour theorists. Colour is used to instil an emotion or an idea in an audience. An interesting point to touch on is Jeanne's hair, which shifts between white, black, lavender, red and green, or some shade of teal, a deep blue-green colour, with each colour having a different meaning. Initially, Jeanne's hair is partially covered with a white veil, with the ends tinged with a light shade of lavender. Whilst clearly purple, the colour is faint. Perhaps this foreshadows what is to come. When the young provincial marries, go to meet the baron and his clack. Jeanne's hair becomes darker and the area of the colour grows bigger as she visibly becomes more nervous. Despite this, I think Jeanne is actually a brunette, as when Jeanne is preoccupied by the devil, so she's not thinking about her assault, her hair appears brown. It's evident that these colours expose Jeanne's emotional state of being. Jeanne is most associated with her lavender hair, with promotional posters depicting her as such. Because lavender hair expresses that she's filled with melancholy, with sadness. And as the title is, Belladonna of Sadness, it makes sense that this is the colour she's most represented by. White hair appears when Jeanne is in a state of bliss, red when she experiences an intense sexual encounter, and black when she's at her lowest point. It also appears later when she's fully transformed into a witch. Post-trauma, a small spirit appears whilst her husband sleeps. The imp in his ordinary shape is phallic in shape, and subtly suggesting the sinister nature of his representation. The spirit explains it heard Jeanne's heart calling out to him, claiming she would give anything for him to help her. Jeanne then asks him if he is the devil. Every time Jeanne calls or asks him this, he doesn't deny it but he doesn't accept it either. Instead he replies, I am you, or that's what people call me. This is important later. The devil explains to Jeanne that he is as big as she wants him to be, promising her power in exchange for her body and soul. Initially, Jeanne only wants the best for her husband's health, refusing to hand over her soul during their first meeting. The devil settles for a simple pleasure instead. What follows is the couple's good fortune, as Jeanne begins spinning thread into cloth sold for untold amounts. Consequently, the couple's fortune rises even as famine strikes the village and the despotic baron raises taxes to fund his war efforts under his oppressive rule. Delighted at Jean being the only one able to pay high taxes, Jean receives a red hat and is elevated to the role of tax collector. We also see a shot of Jeanne's hair being a tinge of green. So let's talk about the colour green. The most notable colour in Belladonna is actually green, with the narrator explaining at one point green is the colour of power, but more specifically, the power of the devil. I'll touch more on this later, but green is also indicative of power in a social sense. This explains why Jeanne's hair was a tinge of light green, as the villagers begin bowing to show signs of respect towards her growing power. It's interesting that the Baron, whilst powerful, is, in terms of his design, devoid of the colour green. Instead, he is black and gold, potentially signifying that death and misery are what hides behind the Baron's riches. On the other hand, his evil queen is a complementary red and very dark muted green, which could symbolise that the queen, like the queen of a chessboard, is the most powerful piece. She's the one that controls the real power. In comparison, when Jeanne's husband was tax collector prior to Jeanne, he dressed in black and a red hat, symbolising that he was just as bad as the Baron when it came to collecting taxes, and because of that, the villagers held no respect for him. With Jeanne, despite having held the same job, she wins over the villagers with her charm. They are more willing to give her money and also respect, hence the green cloak. Jeanne is surrounded and wrapped by butterflies when the devil visits her once again, now having grown in size. The devil growing bigger in size through stimulation carries through the film. As he grows, so does his sense of individual right and self-determination. As a result, Jeanne keeps giving more of herself in exchange for bettering her and her husband's circumstances. 
The butterflies are symbolic of metamorphosis, representing transformation, freedom and rebirth. It can be a reminder to make changes when the opportunity arises or that transformation is inevitable and a natural progression in life. War breaks out and the Baron cuts off Jean's hand as punishment when he fails to collect more money from the villagers, which causes him to become a drunk and abusive. Jeanne calls on the devil, who now depicted as an amorphous black cloud, ambiguously assays her in a similar fashion to her previous assault, allowing the viewer to interpret the visual gaps. During the act, Jeanne submits only her body, attesting that her soul still belongs to Jean and God. Shortly thereafter, Jeanne in a green dress goes to take out a large loan from a moneylender to set herself up in the same trade, eventually becoming the true power of the village. As a moneylender, she essentially feeds the entire village and even the jealous lady and the courtiers. Despite her power as the Baron's wife, her power over the villagers is still very muted in comparison to Jeanne's at this point. Jeanne's bright green cloak in comparison to the lady's muted green design demonstrates that her power outshines the Baron's wife. When the Baron returns victorious from the war, his wife, envious of the respect, admiration and elevated status Jeanne has gained from her village, hints that Jeanne colluded with the devil, implying that she is a witch and has accumulated even more power than him. Because Jeanne's green cloak is symbolic of her power, the ladyship has her page challenge Jeanne's power by slashing her green cloak. As Jeanne loses more of her green cloak, the villagers turn against her, with each slash stripping Jeanne of her power. Running from the mob, Jeanne tries to return home to Jean, but he ignores her desperate cries for help and refuses to open the door. She is assaulted once again. The Baron's wife wishes to have her executed, suspecting her to be a witch, but the local priest advises against this, explaining that if a witch is burned whilst her soul still belongs to the devil and her pride is haughty, the evil in her spirit might spread around like sparks from a fire to all those around. Jeanne takes her limp, beaten body, crawls her way to the wilderness and flees. Something worthy of note here is that women are depicted as being more level-headed than their male partners. For instance, when the Baron becomes dissatisfied with Jean's performance, he fires him but also cuts off his right hand, creating yet another crippled drunk in town. However, when his wife becomes unsatisfied with Jeanne's performance, she efficiently disagrees with Jeanne, successfully banishes her from town, beaten and left for dead. Whilst the men hastily handle their situations without having much foresight, the women are conniving and tactful when it comes to solving their problems. And whilst Jean got buried in his emotions, Jeanne used her emotions as fuel for motivation. In her exile, the devil appears once more and Jeanne at last, with the devil and wilderness treating her better than anyone else has, willingly submits her soul to him. When the two begin intercourse, the devil, now gigantic, completely engulfs her until she disappears into a sea of visual madness. This could be an allegory for the emotional tolls the act can have on the inexperienced, quickly getting out of hand and overwhelming those who aren't ready. A dahlia flower blooms, filling the frame by directly suggesting the forms of a vulva. This fades, revealing Jeanne's legs, her hair in the shape of the dahlia. Soon the lines of the figure become less concentrated, blending, morphing and fading in and out of the devil's colouring. The contrast in colour here is at one of its strongest, with the devil being varying shades of red and brown, with deep blues filling the background. Meanwhile, Jeanne features purples and yellows, eventually blending into the devil's colours as she succumbs to his will. This scene spotlights the feminist v exploitation debate once again. The segment could be read as negating any agency Jeanne may have had, as her actions are to fulfil the devil's desires rather than her own. He wishes to take on an evil soul and exact revenge, actions that are out of character and at odds with her earlier domestic desires. Images of modern society flash across the screen implying that our choices lead to the construction of our current society. Jeanne then emerges with the crimson red hair following the intense encounter. Ceding fully to the devil, Jeanne transforms into a witch whilst declaring her desire to become a horrifying woman. The presence of butterflies is symbolic of this metamorphosis. Jeanne's idea of empowerment at this point in the narrative is to reject the physical appearance which has been credited as an invitation to abuse. 
Despite this, Jeanne is surprised by becoming even more beautiful than God following their pact, and not the grotesque which she desired. The devil counters Jeanne's contempt with her new physique, asking her the simple question, who says anger and hatred are ugly? This bears great significance, signalling a turning point in Jeanne's character arc. Up until this point, Jeanne's physical appearance has been consistently at the disposal of her abusers. She thought redemption would be to renounce this beauty, but her transformation subverts both her own and the audience's expectations. Rather, it allows Jeanne to reclaim and weaponize her beauty, placing her in a position of power. The devil tells Jeanne he has given her beauty for her wickedness, but is she really wicked? Juxtaposed to the royal court, which is grey and washed out, Jeanne is glowing and integrated with nature, a representation of women's sexuality, pure in nature, but abhorred by most societies. Whilst the Baron's wife is covered completely from head to toe, Jeanne is completely bare. The Baron himself is skeletal with demonic eyes and the rest of the court is ghostly. They are surrounded by religious iconography, yet the court is only capable of hurting their underlings. Even the devil in this situation does not hurt others, but helps them. Rather, it is this religious institution which insists on female modesty and constraint whilst hurting others. This could be seen as Jeanne's triumph over religion, which has for centuries discriminated against women. As Jeanne is frolicking in nature, the villagers are stricken with the Black Death. When the world is struck by the plague, the event is not shown directly. Rather, we watch the landscape melt. Baroque images suddenly change to a rapid fire delivery of much more cartoony designs in bold 70s colours. The frenzy of animated images is followed by a beautiful glass painted animation full of metamorphosis. Jeanne, sporting red hair, uses her magic benevolently by chewing flowers and spitting it into medicine to save the villagers from the Black Death. Locals are afraid, knowing the plant, the belladonna or deadly nightshade, to be poisonous. Jeanne is belladonna, known for her poisonous beauty. The belladonna is mentioned directly in the book it's based on. The plant and its mystic medicinal properties fit directly into the film. Jeanne is the most beautiful woman in her village, the only character to be drawn beautiful consistently. It's this beauty which leads to both her power and calamity. The belladonna plant is beautiful sweet, which when bruised emits a nauseating odour. Its specific name, the belladonna, signifies a beautiful lady. Belladonna is a beautiful tragedy. Without her beauty, Jean would have paid the price of one cow, she wouldn't have been essayed by the Baron. And yet, without it, Jeanne would have never been roped into witchcraft, leading her to save the village from the Black Death. Ironically, the Black Plague was seen in religious spaces as an act of the devil. Even more absurd is Jeanne's Christ-like depiction, performing miracles and later being crucified at a burning cross. During her exile, Jeanne's influence over the village reaches its zenith in her divinity, upsetting the royal court. The other meaning of green. We would expect the devil or Satan to be most associated with the traditional red, but whilst he sometimes turns red, his effects on the world are green. The idea of green being symbolic of the devil's influence is expressed early on in the film. After Jeanne returns home from the SA and Jean puts his hands on her, Jeanne's hair is briefly teal. Is this Jeanne crying out to the devil? After Jeanne's first deal with the devil, she starts weaving and selling fabrics that are black and green, implying that the devil has graced the fabric with his powers to make it more desirable to the villagers, in which Jeanne would come to earn more money than her husband's work as a farmer. For the first and second act of the film, a majority of the shots which take place in the fields of brass remain white instead of the colour we'd anticipate for greenery. Because it's only when Jeanne becomes a witch tuned in with nature, we see that grass, which didn't previously mean anything, turn green, suggesting that the land which Jeanne now controls is infused with the devil's power. Now when the town is hit by the Black Plague, Jeanne uses her powers to cure the surviving villagers who are covered in black spots. After Jeanne's treatment, the black dots vanish only to be replaced by smaller marks of green, hinting that, whilst cured, the villagers are now infected with the devil. This leads them later to rebel against the Baron and his church, who were content with watching their subjects suffer and die. 
As the villagers join Jeanne for festivities, the evil queen is referenced again when Jeanne transforms from a jackal to a black caped woman, influencing them to embrace their sexuality which has been repressed by the Baron. The Baron is possessive, controlling and desperate to keep control of his village, so all the villagers engaging in relations and disobeying him is threatening. But even more so is Jeanne's influence over his people. In the scene, people's limbs and bodies appear to blend and intermingle together as one. The enjoyment is a sharp contrast from the first half of the film where the village is judgmental and critical. The lady's page who has fallen in love with the Baron's wife pleads with Jeanne to help him seduce her. Jeanne gives the page a love potion which changes the lady's face to a flesh tone or even slightly red. During the opening scenes, the slashing of Jeanne's cloak and when he visits her, the page's hair is a reddish pink. It could symbolise his actions as he suggests were all for the lady and his love. Under the influence of the potion, the page's hair is green, maybe hinting that he has power over the lady. Her face briefly returns to green and she appears to snap out of the potion's control, rejecting the page's advances. At night, her face returns to the flesh tone, accepting his advances. The page's hair returns to pink and it is revealed that the Baron has unalived them both the page having died for love. Perturbed by Jeanne's power having infiltrated the castle, the Baron sends Jean to invite her into a meeting. The couple reconciles. Jeanne accepts the invitation and in exchange for sharing her cure for the plague, the Baron offers to make Jeanne second in command to him. They essentially try to coax Jeanne into a deal which would return the power to them. Jeanne refuses, seeing through their lies and understanding that bargaining with the Baron would eventually lead to the status quo of patriarchy again. Instead, she calmly wishes for everything, the entire world. Angered by her refusal and realising he stands no chance, he foolishly orders Jeanne to burn at the stake, thus setting up his own downfall. Unclothed, she comes into this world, unclothed, she leaves the world. Seeing his wife burn, the cowardly Jean recognises in the last moments of both of their lives that he failed to support her, finally seeking the courage to turn against the Baron and save her. It shows that even the most vicious and cruel deeds can't kill true love, it can taint it, harm it, but it can never fully extinguish it. However, Jean is immediately unalive. Seeing the tragedy of a young woman unfold and the excruciating doom of a husband who loses his wife twice, the villagers realise that the Baron, fearing Jeanne, is not the one with the power, but it is their free will that moves the tides. Jeanne's life ends on an unhappy note, but she goes on with dignity and triumph, dying as a martyr. In her final moments, she witnesses that Jean did love her through all the misery, and also notices a change in the villagers. As they start to grasp their reality, the power to change the tide, their faces transform into Jeanne's indicating that they stand in solidarity with her. Her death fulfilled the priest's warning, implanting a seed into each peasant, which would grow and one day lead to the French Revolution for the liberation and enforcement of women's rights. Jeanne's overall narrative arc demonstrates her redemption despite her execution. The dissemination of Jeanne's spirit confirms her pride was intact in defiance of the brutality she suffered. Rather than seeking revenge, Jeanne's narrative trajectory is rooted more in restoring dignity to her character. The allusions to Jeanne of Arc, her French name being Jeanne, are somewhat vague, but they are driven home during the pursuit by an army and Jeanne's burning. The close inset shots of her anguished face, especially during her death, are reminiscent of the 1928 film The Passion of Joan of Arc. Both Joan and Jeanne's deaths bring about a revolt from the peasants. The setting advances several centuries in the film's final moments. The scrolling text informs the audience that, on July the 14th, 1789, at the head of the French Revolution stood the woman. The famous painting Liberty Leading the People is the final shot, commemorating Jeanne's spirit as the basis of French liberation. Whilst the film doesn't show the Baron being removed from power, the film ends optimistically, noting that the patriarchy has been overthrown during the storming of Bastille and the French Revolution. 
It ensures that women are at the forefront of this resistance and appears to imply that Jeanne was an inspiration for women. What's interesting is that the final image was added to the film in 1979 when a short and censored version of the film was unsuccessfully re-released in Japan. To the studio's surprise, Belladonna proved most successful with college-aged women. So the re-edits were in an attempt to make it appeal more to young women, since it had been gaining a cult reputation amongst college-age students. The studio wanted less graphic eroticism that would appeal to a younger female audience. The inclusion of the painting, which stands out strongly against Belladonna's watercolour imagery, is often criticised as an unnecessary piece of exposition. Whilst a poetic reference, it could be contended that Jeanne's story is inconsequential for the French Revolution and was simply just an exploitation film which appropriates feminist imagery, targeting a predominantly male audience. The addition of the painting can be seen as an attempt to reaffirm the themes of empowerment, both female and class. Another interesting note is that Jeanne is never presented as the modern type of a feminist. She is, at all times, a woman with long flowing flocks of hair, beautiful clothes and sensuality. Whilst typifying the ideal of second wave feminism, she succeeds without the need to compromise her womanhood. To many, the box office disaster treads a fine line between a socio-political conscious masterpiece and a vulgar portrayal of Jeanne's trials. The graphical depiction of Jeanne's mistreatment leads them to think the reason for Belladonna's existence is to satisfy a schadenfreude fixation. Sex as empowerment has been argued as an idea that can fit too neatly into what the patriarchy expects and imposes on women to serve men sexually. Others ask whether Jeanne regained true agency over her body herself and the ability to make her own decisions at any point. None of the intercourse she had was necessarily pleasurable or consensual. The only reason she chose to fully submit to the devil is because of coercion. Belladonna, accompanied by the pulsating psychedelic rock score by avant-garde jazz composer Masahiko Sato, was inspired by Jules Michelet's Satanism and Witchcraft an account which positions medieval witchcraft as an act of feminine rebellion opposed to the oppression of feudalism and the church, and set against the backdrop of feudal France. Belladonna's inspiration established the idea that witches could heal with herbs and plants, and also wield their sexuality as a weapon. Whilst it offered depictions of women operating outside of their imposed typical social sphere, it is still argued that the empowering elements are still damaging exploitative examples of female sexuality dreamt up by a cis male. Michelet chose to write a world in which the protagonist's beauty, naivete and delicate nature were brought up as testaments to her virtue and value, disavowing her of any direct agency. The empowerment is undermined by repeated references to the protagonist's physicality, sexual subjugation and carnal exploits, which are similar critiques levied at Belladonna. For context regarding the interesting choices of the unique art style, it was said Tezuka, who had conceived Belladonna, had initially misled clients about the cost of making anime, using advance money from one to pay for another, shambling through the 60s, hoping for a big advertising contract or a huge foreign rights sale. By the late 60s, Tezuka had burned all bridges in television, determined to escape into the cinema market by making X-rated films. He figured that they were more adult ticket buyers than children and trusted the art house leanings of grown-up cinema goers. Whilst making the anime Rama trilogy, Tezuka Ram raided the Cleopatra budget to pay for a thousand and one nights, and stuck with the shortfall, he lifted the budget from Belladonna to fund Cleopatra. Unfortunately, neither film was a soaring success, as there was no pre-existing market for the bawdier content, a thousand and one nights and Cleopatra also clocked in at a hefty two hours and the demographic of his previous features had been aimed at children and families. It was suggested that, leaving hardly anything for Belladonna's budget, Yamamoto helming all three and gritting his teeth went full on over the top art house. A different perspective has been argued, that this was a white elephant caused by the artistic aspirations of Yamamoto, which Tezuka indulged to sign Yamamoto for A Thousand and One Nights and Cleopatra. 
In other words, what would be derided by critics as a patchwork film or inanimate animation was intentional. Regardless, the spearing use of animation is more than made up by Belladonna's art director Kunifukai's mad vibrant swirling kaleidoscope light show of medieval tarot card imagery, bewitching watercolour inspirations which bleed and twist together, and his sylph-like character designs. Hand painting each still, his baroque, graphical, lush, distinct neo art novu character, both very psychedelic and very 70s, forms the base of the film. Working with limited resources instead of against it, Fukai drew inspiration from Gustav Klimt and other artists. According to Yamamoto, he wanted his film to be the Japanese answer to Yellow Submarine, but Fukai's decadent early 70s artwork is quite the opposite, dark and disturbing when compared to George Dunning's cheerful fantasies. The lack of movement and absence of lip synchronization meant unbound by traditional tools of animation, his artwork could be highly textured and detailed. Backgrounds consisting of mostly white space, perhaps a budget issue, were intended to enhance the watercolours, giving them more of a pop that would draw the viewer's eye to a certain object or character. The focus on a set piece for each scene through the use of fine detail and colour may convey powerful statements, themes and emotions. His raw art combined with skillful cinematography combines for a stunningly beautiful piece of art and experience that is entirely unique to the medium. It pushes for art that enhances the style and symbolism, and a film that deliberately favours stills and long panning mural shots. Whilst off-putting to some, it contextually reinforces the idea that you are witnessing a Japanese scroll type story, the unfolding of a fairy tale picture book, or a painting coming to life. But what is the devil really? The argument is that if you interpret the devil as a real external force which interacts with Jeanne, it undercuts the film's feminist message and her revolution. The devil in this interpretation is just as much a part of Jeanne's oppression as anyone else. Not only is Jeanne's power to bring about her revolution directly connected with the devil, Jeanne literally submits to this embodiment of the patriarchy to gain that power. Moreover, the devil doesn't just grant her power, he does so through arguably gratuitous SA manipulation and taking advantage of her disintegrating mental state until she is the broken, degraded version the devil wanted all along. He torments her until she finally gives up, essentially dying for the devil. As a side note, the other female character, the Baron's wife, also loses her agency as the page drugs her with a love potion. The more optimistic way of interpreting this narration is that the devil is literally her. Not an exterior force, but as a part of Jeanne's personality that has been demonised by society and patriarchy. When she's giving herself to the devil, she's giving herself to herself, liberating herself from belonging to anyone or anything. This could be why she's initially insecure, having given her body, heart and soul to the devil as he's the embodiment of her personal power and ultimate freedom that is repressed by church and politics. Being viewed as devilish by the religious institution and the baron that wants to subjugate and exploit her. In order to break out, it takes Jeanne committing everything to resist the system that represses her, which could make her feel shame and guilt. She thought choosing herself would leave her alone or in hell, but it gives her a new vigour for life instead. Instead of withering, by focusing on herself, she blooms. Plus, in comparison to the Christian men who do all the evil, the devil ultimately gives her joy, pleasure, healing and freedom. It's a metaphor for having sexual and social freedom. The other argument is that it was never intended to be feminist. Belladonna was made at a time where the Japanese film industry was in crisis. In fact, already in dire straits, the commercial failure of Belladonna would lead to the bankruptcy of the studio. Due to the film industry crisis, many Japanese studios turned to making exploitation films and pink films to stay afloat. Yamamoto himself apparently instructed Fukai that his film was an X-rated film, but make it a love story. This is why some believe that the anime Rama was made as a desperate bid to stave off bankruptcy for the studio. Looking at the first two films of the trilogy, they were more erotic in nature with crude zany humour and parody involved. The accusations of Belladonna's feminism being faux stem from the idea that the first films were relatively straightforward X-rated films. 60s and 70s post-occupation Japan was in the full throes of an economic revival, with women's rights increasingly asserting themselves into the national narrative. 
The women's liberation movement in Japan followed global trends in feminism, but whilst occurring on a similar timeline, the focuses weren't on the same issues as in Western feminism. The Japanese women's liberation movement, Ribu, viewed the current sexual climate in Japan as having strong imbalances of power, fighting ideological gender structure which separated women into virtuous or wanton. Ribu's notions of liberation of sex was not the same as sexual liberation, if the latter were taken to imply the liberalisation of sex relations between men and women. To the contrary, the contemporary trend of free sex was a problematic practice that Ribu women would continue to deplore. The idea is that strong feminist readings are considered much more common outside of Japan, as enlightened and empowered women in 60s and 70s Japan would have not necessarily conjured up the idea of women exercising free love or encouraging it amongst others as opposed to being a part of the 70s Western feminism agenda. In other words, women in 60s and 70s Japan weren't fighting for sexual liberation as in the way it was depicted in the film. The other perspective is that it isn't feminist, but it also doesn't need to be. You can still appreciate the piece for its supposed original intent. Belladonna chronicles the journey of a decaying soul, nothing more, nothing less. It tells the tale of a young, beautiful woman and her misery. If anything were to be taken from this film, it would be sympathy for Jeanne, who in all versions of the film was robbed of her innocence and put to death without justice. To some, the alternate endings are no more valid than the original. Jeanne is every woman that has suffered like she has, the many layers of grief an abused woman goes through, the societal prejudice and inner struggle between a woman's sexuality and the relationship she has with her worth after trauma. Belladonna went on to inspire other animations like Princess Kaguya, Revolutionary Girl Utena and Lupin 3. Between working and doing a professional qualification, I didn't really have much time to make this one so I probably missed a couple of things. So if you have any extra tidbits or analysis, I would appreciate it if you left them in the comments below so we can all have a fuller discussion. I'd also like to hear your thoughts on what you think about Belladonna. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.